All right, everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E1, Understanding Computers and the Internet. So despite what the Extension School's website might tell you, my name is Tommy McWilliam, and I will be your instructor for the semester. So if you're sitting here, there's a good chance that you use a computer most every day. But you might not fully understand what goes on when you turn on the computer or connect to the internet or download a streaming movie. So the goal really of this course is, as the description says, to take the hood off computers and really start to understand exactly what's going on when you use them. So our goals are twofold. One, conceptually, to understand what's happening inside of the computer. And two, more practical, so try to understand how to set up a home network or how to uh, edit graphics with multimedia programs. And so throughout the course, we'll try to uh, build both of these together. So let's start uh, this lecture with a story. So this is the story of what happens when your computer turns on. And we're looking at this not because this is an amazing, fantastic process, so it's very interesting, but really as kind of a tour of what is on the inside of your computer and how all of these various hardware components start to work together. So our story begins. It's 9 in the morning. You hit the power button on your computer, and a whole bunch of stuff is going to happen as your screen starts to light up and come to life. So all of your computer components are connected to something that looks like this. And this is called a motherboard. And the motherboard's job is to coordinate all of the various pieces of hardware that go into making your computer run. So the first thing that's going to happen when you press the power button is something called the power supply is going to kick in. So as you might expect, the power supply's job is to take all the current coming from your wall when you plug it into the wall outlet and convert that into some voltage that it can send throughout your computer. So this is really, as you might expect, what's going to power your computer. So the power supply also has usually a series of fans. And the goal of these fans is to circulate air out of your computer so that nothing overheats. So if we jump back to the motherboard, we can see that the power supply is plugged into this thing up here, the power connector. Whoop. So right up here, the 24-pin power connector. So this is where the power supply is going to plug in to your motherboard. So now that your computer has power, it needs to somehow know what to do with it. Right? We can't just plug something in and all of a sudden expect our computer to be able to connect to the internet and watch cat videos. So the goal of the BIOS, or the basic input-output system, is to tell your computer what to do as soon as it has power. So this really plays a crucial role in the setup of your computer. Right? This is the first instructions that your computer needs to execute in order to turn on. So if we look at the picture again, the BIOS is located up here in the top right. So we see this little flash chip. And we'll learn more about what that means later. But all the instructions that, are that explain to your computer how to start up and how to get going are actually contained on this entirely separate chip, because this is so super important. So what does the BIOS do? The first thing it's going to need to do is it needs to read some settings about your computer, maybe what time it is or some other information about the various hardware components that are connected. And to do that, it's going to read from something called the CMOS. And this stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. So if you're looking for the impressive sounding acronym of the day, this is it. And so this is where things like your system's date and time are stored. And so the BIOS is going to read from this uh, in order to get some basic information. So it's really important uh, that this information isn't lost if your computer loses power or you turn it off. So it turns out that this information is actually powered by its own separate battery, uh, which is really nice. It's a little lithium battery. Um, that's not unlike uh, what you might see in a watch. So here on our motherboard again, right here in the middle, is our little CMOS battery. And this is what makes sure that our computer doesn't lose these super important settings uh, when it turns on and off. So we can also change these settings, much like you can change the time in your computer. The data that's stored inside of the CMOS is not uh, by any means permanent. So the next thing that BIOS is going to do once it reads these basic settings is it's going to perform a series of tests to make sure that your hardware is working correctly. Because you know, if we have something like a faulty component on our motherboard, we don't want to continue the startup process because our computer is not going to work. So the first thing it's going to test is to make sure that our video is working correctly. Right? And so in order to display anything helpful to you, our computer needs to somehow know how to fill in the pixels on your screen. And in doing so, be able to display perhaps some helpful error message. So the computer's graphics card is a little piece of hardware uh, that's in charge of writing all of this output to the screen. So your graphics card might connect uh, via one of these things over here. So these are PCI slots on the right side here. So these PCI slots are designed uh, to give your motherboard some more expandability. 
So right now, your motherboard has, as you can see, all these different components built in. But there's a good chance that you probably want to extend your motherboard with something like a graphics card or even a flash drive. So slots like the PCI slot make this totally expandable. And so you might want to add a new graphics card or even a new sound card, and it could plug into one of those slots over on the right here. So next to it is also this thing called the PCI Express. And this is basically just a newer version of the PCI slot. It's, it's faster, it's better, um, we all, but some other boards might also have these older slots for kind of legacy hardware. So the newest kind of graphics cards uh, might plug into something called an AGP port, uh, which is not pictured here. Um, but does anyone happen to know of any graphics card brands? There are kind of two major ones out there. Does anyone know of any? Yeah, so ATI or NVIDIA. And these are two kind of uh, competing companies. And these are two manufacturers whose job is really just to make these things that power your graphics. So things like high performance gaming or other things like that will probably want some dedicated graphics card to make sure that your computer is getting the performance that you want. All right, so after we've made sure uh, that our graphics cards are working, and here's just what a graphics card could look like, over here on the right, uh, you can see these little yellow strips. And this is exactly where it's going to plug into the motherboard. So you can see here that this would kind of fit into one of those slots over to the right where we were looking. So then we're going to continue our series of tests. And these are now going to be called the POST, so the uh, Power On Self Test. So the motherboard is going to test itself. So unfortunately, if you're reading around, you might see these referred to as POST tests, uh, which happens to stand for the Power On Self Test Tests. So it's one of those acronyms like ATM machine, which is automated transaction machine machine, or pin number, personal identification, number, number. Um, so when we hear POST, we're actually referring to this actual series of tests. So the next thing we're going to test is the computer's memory. So your computer's memory uh, is stored in this thing called RAM, which stands for random access memory. And you may have seen this term you know, as you're shopping for a computer. You see your computer has some amount of RAM. So your computer's RAM is it's basically its short-term memory. So when you have a, a program running, like Microsoft Word or Google Chrome, that program needs to store data somewhere, whether it be temporarily downloading the images on a website or remembering what website you're currently browsing. It's going to do so in RAM. And so typically, your computer has between 2 and 4 gigabytes of RAM. So it really doesn't make sense to store something like your entire movie collection in RAM. That will be stored somewhere else. So the amount of memory you have helps determine how many programs, for example, you can run at once. Right? If I have Google Chrome that wants about a gig of RAM, and I have Microsoft Word that wants another gig of RAM, eventually I'm going to have more, uh, more programs that want more RAM than I have. So uh, by basically upgrading our RAM or increasing the amount of RAM in our computer, that's going to help us do more things at once. So this is helpful for multitasking. So RAM uh, is stored in sticks of memory. So here in our motherboard, up on the top left, uh, you can see these four slots for memory. And so our little RAM looks like this. So this was taken out of a desktop computer, a very old one. So this is about 256 megabytes of RAM, which is not a lot by any stretch of the imagination. You can see here that this would fit nicely into my desktop motherboard up on the top left slots there. So your laptop, on the other hand, might have a much smaller motherboard and might have smaller RAM. So they'll come in different sizes. And this is a stick of RAM that might plug into a smaller computer. As you can see, it's just smaller um, than the one that I held up. OK, so now your computer says, all right, I can display things to the screen. I'm able to save things in my short-term memory. So Google Chrome's going to be pretty happy with me. The next thing I want to do is determine if there are any peripherals plugged into the computer. So a peripheral is just any external hardware that you might plug into one of the ports on the outside of your computer. So what are some peripherals or some hardware that you plug into your computer most every day? What's that? Yeah, so a thumb drive. So that's great. So a thumb drive is much like I have here, a little Mario head, is a little piece of external flash memory that you can plug into your computer and give it some more storage. So that's one. What else might you plug into your computer as a peripheral? Yeah, a printer. So that's great. So a printer is the same way. So you're going to plug that into some port that you can reach. You, know, you don't have to take apart your computer and plug it into one of the motherboard's PCI slot. This is something that you can actually reach and plug in. So a printer, anything else come to mind? Mouse yeah, mouse and keyboard. Great. Some other very helpful things to using a desktop computer. So these are all the things that the post is now going to make sure are plugged in and functioning correctly. So this motherboard here has a bunch of spaces to plug things into down at the bottom here. So over all the way to the right, we have a series of circular ports. So what might those be? What's that? So down over, sorry, on the, the rightmost side here. So that, that column of six different yellow circles. 
Yeah, so this is our audio ports. So this includes things like a speaker, maybe a microphone, maybe a line in so you can plug you know, your MP3 player into your computer or maybe like a guitar amp into your computer. Um, so we're not too concerned with those. So to the left of those now, this topmost one, it looks kind of like a phone jack, but not quite because it's a little bit bigger. This is an Ethernet port. And this is where you can connect your computer to a modem or a Wi-Fi router, as we'll see in a couple lectures, and basically give your computer internet access. So below that, into the column to the left of that, these are USB ports. And USB ports are probably what you've used the most uh, when you're buying any consumer electronics. So as you saw before, a thumb drive very likely plugs in via USB. So pictured here uh, is just one type of USB slot uh, on the motherboard. But it turns out that USB, even though we just commonly call them USB cables, they actually come in a whole wide variety of shapes. So this top left one is probably what we're most used to seeing. If we buy a SanDisk flash drive at Best Buy, it's probably a USB-A connector. However, if we buy a printer, it probably looks more like that port over on the top right, which is the USB-B. So the basic idea behind this is that we can have a cable with two different types of connectors. So if I'm a computer maker and I want to allow you to plug in anything with USB into my computer, I'm just going to say I'm going to give you a USB-A port. So now if I'm a device maker, you know, like a printer, for example, and I decide, well, I think that USB port would just look a lot better on the side of my hardware. hardware. What I can do is just provide a cable that has a USB-B port on one side and a USB-A slot on the other side. So, we can so there's no incompatibility between A and B. They're just two different shapes of things uh, that fit into your computer. So how about these bottom ones here? So we have USB mini. There's also USB micro. What might plug into one of those? Yeah, so a cell phone. So this is really, really common. Uh, a lot of new smartphones, in particular, are starting to standardize on charger ports, which is really, really great. So I still have, uh, admittedly, one of these. So a nice little normal smartphone. So on the problem set one form, I ask, you know, what kind of what kind of phone do you have? So don't feel guilty if you have a normal phone, because I'm among you. And when I was first buying this, and all the phones previous to it, each one had their own stupid charger. And so every time I got a new phone, I'd have to either get a new charger, or if I lost my charger, I would have to buy another one. I couldn't just use my charger from my old phone. But luckily, now that we're starting to standardize on this USB, on this USB type connector, suddenly I can just go and use my friend's charger or something like that. So this is a, a fantastic thing. Uh, anything else that might plug in with uh, USB micro or mini? Yeah, so digital cameras. And so what might be the motivation? So why might my digital camera want to use this USB mini instead of my, say, USB B? If I'm a camera maker, why might I want that? What's that? Transfer pictures. Yeah, exactly. So now that'll allow me to plug in my uh, camera to my hard drive. But what, may, what might make me choose USB mini in particular? Yeah, size. So right. So if I'm if I'm Nikon and I have Ashton Kutcher or whoever he promotes, and he's promoting my really cool, thin, sexy camera, I don't really want this big, gigantic port coming out the side of it. So I might choose USB Micro um, just because of its size limitations. And again, there's nothing fundamentally incompatible with all of these different types of USB connectors, and that's uh, what's great about having a cable with two different sides to it. So uh, up next on the left here, all the way to the left, it looks like we have some different slots here. So the top, the top pink slot and then the bottom left one are respectively parallel and serial ports, uh, which used to be uh, ways to transfer data uh, to a printer or something like that. But they're kind of fallen out of vogue right now. There are much more faster and newer ports available. Much anything that you used to plug into one of these ports is now USB enabled, except for this one here in the bottom right. And this is what's called a VGA port. So does anyone happen to know what plugs into that? Yeah, a monitor. So a VGA port is used to transfer display data from your computer, whether it be a desktop or a laptop, and transfer that to a monitor. So VGA is just one way of hooking up some kind of external display to your computer. So if you've recently bought a DVD player or a Blu-ray player, you probably connected it to your television using something like this. And this is called an HDMI cable. An HDMI cable is kind of a newer, faster way of transferring data, you know, in particular HD graphics data or movie data. And it's designed to be much faster than something like VGA. So an HDMI connector is entirely digital. So that means that anything you send along this cable is either a 0 or a 1. So a VGA, on the other hand, is analog. And it's more than just zeros and 1s. So if you bought a computer monitor that didn't have an HDMI uh, connector, if you purchased it somewhat recently, it may have a connector that looks something like this. And this is called a DVI cable, or Digital Video Interface. And DVI, much like HDMI, is also digital. 
It's newer, and it's sending along only zeros and ones. However, there's a drawback here with DVI, and that if you've ever you know, got your desktop computer or your laptop and you hooked up your monitor and then started playing a song, you may have noticed that the sound is still coming out of your closed laptop sitting inside of your desk instead of your fancy speaker system. So DVI actually has to have this separate audio connector, much like my computer has now, and while uh, HDMI, on the other hand, can transfer audio and video. So that's why if you hooked up your Blu-ray player, there's a good chance you didn't need to plug in some separate audio thing. So finally, uh, VGA looks like this. Again, we'll need a separate audio channel, and this is all analog. And so this is a little bit antiquated technology, but still in use all the time. Um, many projectors, for example, uh, use VGA in order to output data.